Good morning, Christchurch in the Valley. We want to welcome you. We especially want to welcome those of you who are visiting with us for the very first time. We're so glad that you chose us, that you want a fellowship with us in your homes today. We're so grateful for you. We thank God for you. And so at this time, we're grateful that we can worship in our own homes. Yes, we're sad. We miss our church. But guess what? We are the church. Christ lives in us and he dwells right here in our homes. So right now, I want you to prepare your hearts, your minds, that to allow the Lord to take up residency in your home. If he's not already there, invite him there. And so right now, we just give you all the praise and all the honor, God, for bringing us here today. We especially want to take a super time out because today's a great day. You know what today is? Today's Father's Day. So I want to give a special shout out to all the dads, all the awesome dads, doing a wonderful job, taking care of your kiddos, working hard, covering us with your prayers. We appreciate you. We love you so much. We hope that you know that you're seen and you're appreciated, especially those of you who are taking care of kids who are fatherless. We thank you for stepping up. And so at this time, I want to take a time out to bless my husband, Mr. Corey Saxon. God bless you and thank you for being an awesome dad to our kids and being a great husband. I hope you're blessed today. Go ahead and take this time to just pray. Lord, we come to you and we give you all the honor, all the praise for who you are, for what you're doing. We thank you, God, for waking us up this morning, for giving us the breath in our lungs. We thank you, Lord, for a heart that can be fixated on you, that in crazy times where we don't understand or we can't make sense of what's going on, that your word and your promises to your children are yes and amen, and we can find comfort in you, Christ Jesus. So settle our hearts, God, as we prepare to receive the word from you. We pray that you bless every single household with your love, your joy, your peace, your presence, and just have your way. We invite you, Lord. I pray that you would comfort those who need the comfort. I pray that you, Lord, would encourage those who need you right now. And Lord, we just pray over our pastor as he comes forth and, and brings the word, Lord God. Let it be edifying unto your kingdom and to your children, Lord God. We just give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're now going to turn this time of service over to Miss Tiffany for worship. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship. My name is Tiffany and our song today is Freedom Reigns and it does. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So I just pray that this song ministers, worship with me and just give everything to God. Amen. Where the spirit of the Lord is.
bless you and happy Father's Day. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Christ Church in the Valley, church family, um, internet family. Just want to say good morning to you all. Um, amazing start to a great worship service so far. Um, I want to thank my wife for the great job that she did opening up this morning. And are all yellow. Didn't she look as bright as the sunshine? Um, I loved it. Uh, also, Tiffany Martin for the amazing worship. I guess it was just yellow day. I, I wasn't in sync. I should have had on a yellow shirt today. I um, want to also take a moment to wish all of the dads out there a happy Father's Day. Um, listen, what you do for your families, um, you can't even measure it with words. Um, I just believe being a father is one of the, um, the greatest jobs that us men that are blessed to have families uh, could do. Um, so the great thing about it is you don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be uh, great at it, but we have to be present, right? Your effort needs to be great, right? There's no such thing as a perfect dad. Um, so God sees our effort, um, and all we have to do is our very best. So I just want to, again, charge you men. Um, I pray that today is special for you, is blessed for you. Uh, your, your family treats you like kings, right? Um, your kids draw you great pictures. I remember when my kids were young, um, they used to draw great pictures. Now they're old, older, and they got bank accounts, so hopefully they bought me something nice. Uh, but no, just seriously, uh, happy Father's Day to all of you guys out there, um, and God bless you. Um, just a reminder, as we get into the service, um, we are going to do communion today, so go ahead and get your elements ready right now if you don't already have them ready. Um, and then also share this page, share this link uh, on, your, on your Facebook page so that uh, the gospel can be preached and reached uh, worldwide. Uh, more and more people each week, because of all of our efforts together, are watching it. And it's not that I'm just trying to draw more eyes to uh, what we're doing here at Christ Church of the Valley, but just as the body of Christ as a whole, um, it's just amazing to see people who wouldn't or ordinarily have the gospel received on a Sunday. Um, that they can be prayed with and for, they can receive a great word, um, and then also have uh, salvation offered to them. Uh, so go ahead and share it on your page, start a watch party. Um, we'll go ahead and pray and get started, get into the word. Uh, Father, we thank you. We're grateful for this day, Lord God. You uh, made it a beautiful day here, at least in Southern California, Lord God. The sun is shining. Um, I get to spend it with my beautiful family um, here in my living room and also my beautiful church family, Lord God. So I'm a blessed man, Lord God. I pray that those that are watching, Lord God, and those that are hearing this message would also feel blessed, Lord God, by your presence um, with your word, Lord God. Thank you for the worship that's already going forth, Lord God. Uh, thank you for this Father's Day, Lord God. We ask that... Uh, those men who have, um, one, lost fathers, Lord God, or fathers that have lost children, Lord God, uh, pray a special extra blessing for their lives today, Lord God, that there be no void, that there be no lack, Lord God, that we can remember the good times, Lord God. Uh, I pray for us fathers, Lord God, who are um, still fathering our um, younger children, Lord God, even grownups, Lord God. Um, that you would bless us on this day, Lord God. Um, continue to guide us and lead us and show us how we can be the best fathers that we can be um, and be the best family men that we can be, Lord God. I pray over this service and the word that you've given us this morning, Lord God, um, that it be an added blessing to the body of Christ, Lord God, that those that are here to receive something, Lord God, will receive exactly what they came for and then some, Lord God. I pray that they will be bountifully blessed today um, with the word of God, Lord God. Um, let it permeate in our lives. Let it resonate in our lives, Lord God. Let it go from our heads to our hearts and back out through our mouths, Lord God. And we begin, we begin to be great witnesses for you um, everywhere we go. So we love you. We praise you um, as we also pray for our nation, Lord God, that you continue to heal our land, um, heal the people, heal our hearts, bring us closer together um, in this season. We love you. We praise you. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so typically, you know, on certain days, like you got Father's Day, Mother's Day, um, what else do we have? We have Christmas. We have certain days to where you'd give a certain message. Um, today, uh, or this week rather, as I searched and I seek the, the Lord, um, I thought that I was going to come up with a perfect Father's Day message, and that's not where he had my heart. It's not where he had my mind. Um, so we'll, we'll thank the fathers up front, and then we'll thank them again um, you know, on the other end. But I don't think to, God wanted us to deliver a message that was solely for fathers. I think that he wanted to deliver a message uh, that was universal can, and can be used for the whole body of Christ. Um, so that's our message today um, as we're getting into it. So just know, um, again, I wanted to dedicate it to just the dads out there, um, but the Holy Spirit sent us in a different direction. So I pray it'd be a blessing and add perspective to your hearts and your minds um, today as we go through it. Amen. Um, the title of the message today is Pouring Out My Soul. 
right? Pouring out my soul. And it comes from a passage of scripture um, from 1 Samuel, uh, starting in chapter 1, verse 2. Um, and it's a familiar chapter of scripture for some people, um, but it's 1 Ch Samuel chapter 1, verse 2, and we're going to go through verse 15. So we're going to do a little bit of reading this morning. So I hope you have your Bibles ready. Um, just to get, I'm not going to read verse 1, but we're speaking of a man called Elkanah, right? Uh, so ver we're going to pick it up in verse 2, um, and the man that we're talking about um, is Elkanah. So he, meaning Elkanah, had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from the city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hapni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanai sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. But Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, which was Penina, used to provoke her grievously and irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, right? On and on, every single year, they'd go up to festival and Penina would antagonize Hannah. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And this began to wear on her. I don't know how many years this had gone on prior, um, but Hannah now, she just couldn't take it. Have you ever been to a point in your life, and many of us are kind of there right now, where things are going on and you just can't take it? Right? It feels like you're being antagonized. It feels like you're being provoked and prodded and pushed and, and pulled in every direction. And you just get to your breaking point. Um, just know Hannah was here at her breaking point. Uh, verse 8, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Verse 9, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed. So what did she do? She prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. And verse 12, and she continued praying in, uh, before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman, which when people went up to temple those days, because wine was often around, um, especially around times of uh, the festival or, or the ceremony that they were attending, um, there was wine and there was what we know as today is beer, but it was fermented drinks. Um, and people would get a little tossed, I guess, before they went into the temple. So it wasn't uncommon for people to drink before they went in. Sometimes the liquor, because of the heat, would get a be the better of them and they would be drunk in the temple. So Eli, one of his jobs was to make sure that he would keep the drunken people out or keep it under control. So she, he assumed because of what time of year it was and because of the way she looked that she was drunk. And uh, verse 14, and Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, and this is our key verse, verse 15. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to do a little teaching today, and then I'll do a little preaching, and then I'm going to have you out of here to enjoy the rest of your Father's Day. Uh, but here's the teaching portion. Let's break down the text. Uh, first of all, Elkanah, he had two wives. So me, this is just me personally. The Bible doesn't give an account for this, but I just drew my own conclusion. Elkanah could not have been a wise man. The reason why I say that is because any man that has one wife knows that one is more than enough, right? So he had more than one wife, um, so he could not have been wise. He was married to two wives. Um, his wives were Hannah and Penina. Um, we're led to assume that Hannah was his first wife. 
um, because of the way that she's listed in scripture. It had her name before Paninus. And typically when that happens in scripture, if it names one son before the other, the one that was named first is the oldest. If it names one wife before the, the other, it means that the one that was named first, again, was the first wife. Uh, the scripture tells us that Elkanah and his family went up year after year uh, to this town of Shiloh to worship and make sacrifices to the Lord. All different types of sacrifices were made, um, and they would bring their best to this place. Um, every man would bring his family um, to this place and, and do the same ritual year after year. Um, according to the Bible, it was a tradition, again, um, that was followed from all the way from the days of before Joshua, right? So they've been going there for a very long time um, to Shiloh. And eating meat wasn't necessarily a daily function of the Israeli diet at the time, right? So men would give a portion of the meat to their wives uh, according to how many children she had. And, and they would share the meal, uh, the meat amongst their individual families, right? So if a man had a couple of wives, if one had three um, children and one had two children, obviously the one that had three children would get more meat. Um, but this was unusual in the sense that Elkanah, being sensitive uh, to Hannah and the needs of her heart, um, he would, it, and because he loved her, he gave her a double portion, right? And I've heard this preached so many times. People talk about a double portion, um, and, and, and a double portion sounds like a good thing. But in this instance, um, Hannah didn't want a double portion of meat. She wanted some kids. What, what good was it that she had all this meat and no kids to share it with, right? So, um, again, I've heard so many pastors and preach, you know, the double portion, the double portion. And I'm thinking, like, where it was written at right here in this story wasn't necessarily a good thing. She had a surplus, right? Um, childbearing was very important. Uh, to the women of Israel, because the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply. It was a part of who they were, a as it is today in today's culture. Like so many women desire to have children because it's a, it show it, to some, it shows it's a true blessing from the Lord, right? So she had a strong desire and year after year, she wasn't able to conceive and year after year, she'd have to go up here and, and this old wretched Panaya uh, would be whispering things and saying things and backbiting and, and ridiculing her. Uh, because she didn't have children, right? She made her vulnerable um, to be ridiculed. So imagine your rival, right? Pushing your buttons every chance that they got, right? Now, some, now right now, let's relate this to today. And let's put ourselves in position of Hannah. Um, year after year, we want change, right? Certain people want change. And year after year, your rivals are just pushing you down, right? So how do you respond? If you're Hannah, how do you respond, right? Do you fight? Right? Is it worth the fight? Do you ignore them? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt. That's not always the truth. Sometimes this junk hurts, right? Um, how would you fight? Would you fight with your words? Would you fight with your fists? Uh, you know, would you return evil for evil? You know, because what Panina was doing was pure evil, but would you return that evil with more evil? Um, would your feelings be hurt? Um, I want you to, for the rest of this story, uh, for the rest of this time that we spend together, put yourself in the position of Penina, the oppressed. And how would you feel if every single year you desire change and no change is happening, right? You desire to be pregnant with your dream, with your goal, um, but there's no pregnancy, right? Um, how would you respond? Um, the Bible goes on to talk about um, Hannah, and, and um, from my studies, I found that Hannah was a devout woman of faith. Women, it's something that, again, if you want to study a woman in the Old Testament especially, um, study Hannah because it talks about her dedication to the Lord, right? And this could have been in spite of or because of she couldn't have children. Sometimes you get closer to God because you, you don't have the things that you desire, or sometimes you just have a heart for God. The Bible doesn't say why she was so devout. Um, you know, and I, I was interested in finding out, did she just want something from God? No, but really it was leaning more towards, she just had a heart for God, right? She just had a heart for God. Um, and the text just makes it clear that she was committed to the Lord. Um, so here's some information that you may not have known about Hannah. Again, I, I love pulling out facts and um, just giving them to you all because, again, if the more of the text we know, um, the closer it brings us to God, right? If we really truly know his word. Um, I've just heard this story before, but as I was studying, I was like, bringing out facts. And I was like, this is interesting to me. So hopefully it's interesting to you. Um, Hannah, it says, was one of the most, if not the most devoted women of God in the Old Testament. Um, and here's why. She is shown going to the house of the Lord and no other woman is shown in the Old Testament doing this. Can you believe that? 
right? So fact check it, get your Bibles out and see in the Old Testament, especially up until um, 1 Samuel, and see if there's any other women that it shows going into the house of the Lord to seek the Lord on matters, right? Hannah is the only woman in the Old Testament fulfilling a vow to the Lord, making and fulfilling a vow to the Lord. It doesn't show women. The Lord made vow to certain men and, and men made vows to the Lord, um, you know, Jacob made a vow and God made a vow to Abram or Abraham, if you will. Um, but Hannah's the first woman to make a vow to the Lord and to fulfill it. She is the only woman um, said to specifically pray in the way that she prayed, meaning she mentioned the name of the Lord 18 times in her prayer. Right. And, and prayer up to then was done primarily by the men of God. Right. It's uh, the Bible, um, especially the Old Testament, is spotlights is spotlights men praying to the Lord. But it put a spotlight on Hannah um, on a couple of instances. And, and Hannah prayed fervently. Right. And unlike other infertile women, because there was other infertile women, there was Sarah, there was Jacob's wife. There was a couple of different wives in the Old Testament that were barren and could not have children. But they made schemes of their own to produce children, right? For instance, when um, Jacob's wife, I mean, sorry, Abraham's wife, um, you know, they said that you were going to be pregnant. She was really old, so she was thinking of something like, you know what, I'm too old. Why don't you go have a baby with her, right? Maybe that's what the Lord was talking about. They made a scheme and went away from the voice of the Lord or the ways of God um, to do things in their own power. But Hannah wasn't like them. She sought the Lord um, to give her clarity uh, on the things that she desired of the Lord, right? So she went straight to the Lord, right? Amen. Now, speaking of Penina, uh, wife number two, um, she was called Hannah's rival and she was vicious, right? Have you ever had a vicious rival? Um, sometimes your rival could be uh, several people or a whole system, if you will, right? And her rival provoked her and, 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 she, and she taunted her. And Hannah wept because of her taunt, taunts, the word says. She just couldn't take it anymore, right? Uh, when it was time for the annual, annual festival, um, Penina doubled down on the insults, and it just crushed her, right? It hurt her so much this particular time she couldn't even eat. And they were going to a festival, and that was a huge part of it, is that they all ate together as a family. She couldn't even eat, and that's when Elkanah um, addressed her. H have you ever felt so bad, so low, so down, that um, even when people tried to console you, um, th there was no letting up? You see, her husband couldn't help her out of this one. Only God can help her out of this one, right? And, and for some of us, that's exactly where we are today. Elkanah tried to fix it, but um, she needed a true intervention from God. Right. Um, so here enters Eli. Eli isn't portrayed as the sharpest elder in the book. Right. Um, you know, I thought he was a really wise guy, but it turns out that um, he, the Bible, it kind of puts him in a position where maybe necessarily he wasn't. He wasn't the, the greatest father. Right. He, he talk about his children, um, about them bringing in sacrifices and all of this other stuff. But then he would benefit from them greatly. So he cursed them on one hand and benefit um, from it. Right. So he partook in that um, and, and different things like, you know, they said that he didn't have great perspective either spiritually or naturally. Um, here was an old dude who didn't know what was going on. Um, in those days, the elders that were too old to serve, um, they didn't necessarily go into the temple. Um, they would sit at, you know, he was sitting at the door uh, of the fellowship hall, um, if you will, or the synagogue or the temple um, that Hannah was in. So he saw her go in with her family, um, distressed, and then he saw her come out after she got done eating. And he was just sort of watching her as she went into the place of prayer, um, you know, as he sat, you know, outside on the outskirts. Um, so when Hannah was crying out to the Lord, the first thing Eli thought was, she must be drunk. This woman is drunk. Right. So Hannah cries to the Lord in distress. She cried out, Lord Almighty. Um, and if you study the Old Testament scripture, she was actually the first person in the Old Testament, man or woman, that addressed the Lord in this manner. Lord Almighty. Hannah recognized that a relationship with the Lord involves giving. So she called herself his servant. So it's not just taking. So many times when we want something from the Lord, uh, it's easy to just say, Lord, give me this. Lord, give me, give me, give me. As the Lord is a genie or something like that. Uh, but Hannah said, your servant. And, and she vowed to serve the Lord. She vowed for her son to serve the Lord. So it was a give and take relationship that she desired. Yes, she wanted something in return. But she says, I'm willing to serve you. And I'm willing to have my son serve you all the days of his life. 
life if you would allow me to just have this one blessing. Amen. Um, so she that's a valuable lesson again for us today. Um, let's look for ways where we can serve the Lord. How about that? And asking them for things, especially just imagine your children. Um, if they only asked you for things, those of you who are parents, um, you would be a little perturbed and a little irritated. God is a gracious God and he continues to give and he continues to love. Um, but I know just like it feels good to me as a parent, it feels great to the Lord. If you say, Lord, what can I do for you? Ask not what the Lord can do for you, but what can you do for your Lord? How about that? Um, but Hannah made a vow to the Lord to give her son to him, right? Eli witnessing her prayers, he was watching her lips and not perceiving her heart. Sometimes when you cry out to God, those watching you, right? So right now, some of us are beginning to cry out. Those watching you, they can't perceive what's going on. To them, you may look crazy in your sincerity to the Lord. Never mind what other people think. Never mind what it looks like. Um, cry out to the Lord. Prostate. Lay out if you have to. Um, use all of your energy to, cry, to pour your soul out to the Lord as Hannah did. And don't take it so personal when people don't understand you. Because Hannah wasn't bothered by anyone. She wasn't bothered by Eli in that moment. She went to the sanctuary and she poured her soul out to the Lord and she emerged a different woman. You know what happens when you get on your knees and you cry out to the Lord and you give him all of your problems and you give him all of your desires and you place them in his hands. You put all the anxiety, all the frustration, all of the anger, all of the hatred that you've been harboring, that you have, that you think you can handle. But we can't handle this stress on our own, right? When you I was about to say peed off, right? But I don't know if you can say that at church, but matter of fact, this is I'm preaching, so I'm going to say it. When you're pissed off and you just can't take it no more, right? You got to cry out to the Lord. Pour your soul out to the Lord, and, and you emerge as a different person. Once you cry out and get some stuff off your chest um, that you begin to have, that you have pinned up, um, then hope comes to your situation almost quickly and immediately. The Lord meets your desires. See, the Lord wants us to be sincere. What's bothering you, sons and daughters? What's bothering you, brothers and sisters in Christ, right? It is what's going on today. It's being pinned up in the house with the pandemic because it's a new wave now. People are being sick all over again. Does that bother you, right? Cry out to the Lord. Does social injustice, does racism, does systematic racism bother you? Cry out to the Lord. And get it off your chest. Don't just carry anger around. We should be beyond that. Our response should be to go into the place of worship, to go into the place of prayer and cry out to the Lord and emerge as different people so that hope can begin to set in. Last week we talked about um, holding on to hope. Well, we can't have hope unless we pour out our hearts to the Lord. That's where it would begin. When she left, it was an example of a triumphant, of triumphant faith. Right? Her faith was just expanded because the, she allowed the Lord to come into her situation. Are we doing that as a nation, as a body of Christ? Are we allowing to, the Lord, as even I'm speaking specifically in this sentence, to people of color, are we allowing the Lord to come into our situation? Are we crying out to him so that he can begin to move in our situation, right? It, there was a triumphant moment of faith um, as she emerged. She had a spiritual victory uh, that was won. Uh, um, through labors of tearful prayers, right? I mean, there's times over these last several weeks that I didn't know what else to do. I was trying to mount a response and uh, say a perfect word and uh, meet the people of God and all of these different things, but I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I didn't know what to do. So it wasn't until I had a great release to the Lord um, that the Lord began to work with me and started giving us a response and started saying, hey, listen, this is how I want you to fight this battle. Right. And I'm going to do this fighting on your behalf. And this is how I want you to stand. Right. Uh, so she felt so good after the pouring out that she even went out and ate. Right. It restore your appetite and, and your normal activities. Right. Uh, so here's some of the preaching that I'm going to do. And then I'm going to get you out of here. That's a valuable lesson for where we are today. Right. There are things happening now that we have no control over. We, we can't control all of these different things. On Tuesday night, um, I even mentioned the serenity prayer for those of you who were um, on the line. And um, Sister Francine helped me out because in that moment I drew a blank. Um, you know, but the prayer of serenity, like, you know, Lord, just giving me, um, you know, just wisdom and understanding. Like, you know, the things that I can change, the things that I can't change, and courage to change the things that I, that I can, right, um, that, that I'm called to. To paraphrase, um, there are things that we cannot control right now. We need God to intervene in a real way. Um, we've been in isolation due to COVID for months. Anybody tired of it? Like, if you're tired of being in a house, 
You can put in your comments right now and say, I'm tired of it. Right? But God. Right? But God. Right? What's the good that's coming out of it? We get an opportunity to pray. The whole world is slowed down. I've spent more time with my family these last few months than I've had an opportunity to spend in a very long time. Right? We had an opportunity to pray together, um, spend time with my son as he's growing. Right? He's a growing boy. He's as tall as me now. Uh, and I looked up and I thought about it. I said, man, in the next like five years or so, I won't have this time anymore. The last 13 years, he's almost 13 and just flown by. My daughter will be 11 um, and here in just a couple of months. We only have her here for another few years. So this is time that I'll never be able to get back. So I'm starting to look on the positive side of things. I'm tired of COVID. I'm tired of hearing about people dying and being sick. Um, and I'm tired of hearing misinformation on the news and with our government and the way that the, the, the news is being disseminated. I'm tired of people saying, oh, I think COVID is a hoax. It's like, fool, you don't see people dying? What's wrong with you? Like, you know, I'm tired of the naysayers. I'm just tired of it. I'm over it, right? I'm tired of the racial inequality and injustice. I'm tired that we are still living with this. I'm tired that I listened to Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and, and 50 plus years later, uh, we're still dreaming about equality and freedom, right? I'm tired of it. Right? You gotta be tired of it. People are losing their jobs. I'm tired of the economy going up and down, right? And, and, and uh, people being affected, marriages and relationships because people have been in the house, because there's been so many crazy things going on. I'm tired of the abuse. So many kids are being abused right now um, and they're living in silence because uh, there's no one there to rescue them. They can't go to school uh, and, and they're just being beat on at home. I'm tired of it. Tired of marriages being messed up, right? We do a ton of marriage counseling. And right now with families being able to have time together and being around each other more than ever in 2020 than they've been in the last several years, if, if, if any time in their life, uh, but people still can't come together, right? I'm tired of it. Tired of the divide between the police and um, the citizens. I'm tired of it, right? We got to be tired of it. So what do we do with that? What do we do with these frustrations? I mean, with this frustration, we got to begin to pour out our heart to God. There's nothing else we can see. We're fighting against something that's, it's not tangible. It's intangible, right? It's not natural. It's not in the earthly realm. What I'm discovering about this is it's not just a black and white thing. It's not just a police against civilian or civilian against police thing. This is evil we're fighting, right? We have an antagonizer. We have a, a poker and a prodder. We have a panina right now in our lives and in our midst. We got to go to God. It didn't say that Hannah addressed her. So why are we continuing to address our enemies on social media, um, showing up face to face, arguing? Um, and, and again, I'm for the protest, but is that what's really only going to get it done? That gets certain things done as far as legislation changes, but they've changed the laws and people are still entangled. It, 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 uh, uh, in racism, right? Legislation won't change this alone. Only the hand of God, right? So times are changing, and sometimes we don't adapt well to change, and that's just true. People just don't adapt well to change. I'm one of them. Um, I like my things to be kind of laid out um, the way that I see them in my head, um, and I'm sort of like Rain Man, if you guys have ever seen that movie. Um, if anything is moved or if anything doesn't go according to plan, um, then I just kind of get kind of discombobulated, and that's kind of what's happening right now. Our normal routine has been interrupted, right? Um, we talked about it, I think, last Tuesday or last Sunday, I can't remember, um, but, you know, God has disrupted our normal programming. So we can't pretend like this stuff isn't happening. We have to address it head on, but it's just a matter of how we're going to address it. Are we going to go and continue to fight fisticuffs and um, bump chests with people and tell people how evil they are? You know what? When you tell people that are evil that they're evil, they don't agree with you. They don't care what you think about them. Right? And, and all that does is leads to more frustration. So how about we begin to do what the Bible says and we put ourselves in the position of Hannah and we pour our soul out to the Lord. Uh, and again, we talk, I talked about it the last couple of weeks, actually. That's the last card that we like to play, but that's the best card that we have. We have to play it right now. Right now is the time. Put it down. Right? You got to put the card down and you got to begin to play unless we're going to explode. 
Right? We can't carry this, right? We can't carry it. It's not good mentally for us. It's not good physically for us. Um, and, and we'll just be uh, running around in circles and not much change is going to happen. So Martin Luther King, as he marched and protested um, every morning, just like Jesus Christ, and every single night, where did the people found, find him? They found him, retreated someplace alone, and he prayed and he poured his life out and he poured his heart out. He poured his soul out to the Lord, right? Uh, talking and trying to get people to understand what you're going through, uh, it may not get the job done on this one. A conversation or debate isn't going to solve the systemic problems that we've had in this country long before you or I ever arrived. In fact, these problems go long back um, to the Bible days. Right? There's always been segregation and all of these kinds of things, and only God can handle it when it's at this level. Not a good conversation is just going to solve these things. Right? Uh, this isn't a lack of common sense that we're dealing with. We're dealing with things that are of a spiritual matter, so just understand that. Um, sometimes the more you talk about it to people who don't get it, the more frustrated you become. You ever find yourself um, in a good Facebook debate and say, no, this is racist or this isn't right or this is systemic. And people are like, what are you talking about? That was a long time ago. I'm tired of it. Right. You know, so it is a time to just have these debates and typing back and forth and being ticked off and unfriending people. Uh, you know, that's not how we should be handling this necessarily. Right. This may cause you to lose your composure fighting only that way. Again, I'm not saying that you can't fight that way. I mean, I, I encourage it from time to time. I mean, a good Facebook debate ain't never hurt nobody. But that isn't where you should spend the majority of your time is what I'm saying. People not may not hear your heart. Right. They don't come from the same places um, necessarily. So a good conversation is not going to solve it. And, and what will happen is you'll get more and more frustrated. You'll display anger and then it makes you look crazy. Right. You ever had a situation, right, even in your relationship, like, you know, uh, my wife, like she's she's a great person. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm a perpetual like um, line stepper. Right. So so there's a line and I like step to the line and then step over the line. And she has a bunch of grace. Um, but grace um, with humans can only go so far. So she'll get to her boiling point and she will blow up. And everything I did over the last couple of years you know, will come out. And I'm looking at her like, man, you tripping. Like, you crazy. The worst feeling in the world is when you're expressing your heart and somebody makes you to, out to be crazy. Well, you're telling the truth, right? Uh, you know, so they don't, people won't just listen, right, to your heart. So quit trying to explain something. We can't expect the oppressor to be the solution. You catch that? Right. So so if you think the system is a problem or certain people are the problem, go in and explain it to, to them. Hey, you're the problem because of this. Don't expect them to say, hey, you know what? You're right. That's great insight. I'm going to change my whole life because of how you feel. People don't care how we feel right now sometimes. Right. So what we have to do is, again, put it in the hands of God. and We have to begin to pour on our soul uh, to the Lord because there's a difference. I want you to know there's a difference between being angry and being bitter. Being angry is one thing. Um, but being bitter is being toxic. Right now, there's a lot of people who are angry, who are hurting, worried, confused, uncomfortable, uneasy. Um, there's been a total disruption everywhere. Um, the whole system is on trial, right? The year of perfect vision, we, like I talked about last week, we can see all of this stuff clearly. Um, everything is coming to head, right? Everything is coming to head. The world is in transition. With uncertainty, though, comes opportunity for something real to take precedence in a dying world. Right? We have an opportunity, people of God, to reintroduce the kingdom of God to a dying earth. Because the earth systems doesn't work. It's full of favoritism, prejudice, racism, um, bitterness, hatred, um, and all kinds of things that are all kinds of ungodly ways. Right? Um, but we've got an opportunity to replace the natural government with the government of the kingdom of God, right? We've gone away from it, right? They took, they've taken God out of our government for the most part. I mean, as far as I can see, um, they've taken God out of our schools. Um, you can't pray anywhere anymore, 
right? You, you know, I mean, if you pray over your food in the restaurant, they might escort you out because they say, oh, you may be offending someone. Listen, there's a small opportunity right now where we can put moral Christian values back into society, but we have to be the people um, that are executing properly, getting the play from God, and we can only do that through prayer. I'm just stressing prayer because that's where the Lord has me, and I believe that's where the Lord wants us right now. Evaluate your prayer life. Are you praying right now for these things? I mean, really fervent praying, right? We're doing a lot of talking about it, a lot of tweeting about it, a lot of chatting about it, a lot of pointing their fingers about it, a lot of blaming about it, a lot of they don't understand about it, a lot of being ticked off about it, but are we praying about it? Are you pouring your soul out about it to the Lord? Are you listening to what he has to say to you? Like Hannah, we need to begin to pour out. Don't worry about our oppressor in this season. We can't worry about them. They, they got a job to do. We got a job to do. Does that make sense? They're powered by something else. Let's call evil evil. Evil is not going to acquiesce, so then we begin to pray. Let's sick the Holy Ghost on evil. How about that, people of God? Right? That's our best weapon. Prayer is our best defense in this season. And then when God gives you something to do, then it's right. Right? Don't act it according to your own feelings and your own flesh right now because you may be doing the wrong thing even peacefully trying to talk this stuff out. No, I don't need no more conversation. We've done the talking. Right? You shouldn't have to convince somebody what right is. We should intrinsically, we should just know it. We should innately know right from wrong. But people don't know God. So we have to introduce God to them. So asking God, God, how do we introduce you to a world that doesn't understand you? And I bet you he'll begin to show you ways to show love uh, that you couldn't fathom. Right? People are looking for truth and justice now more than ever. God is truth and justice. So they're looking for God, just don't know it yet. God is a just God. His word says it. Um, as people are calling for righteousness, they're calling for the name of God. People are in the street marching. Righteousness, justice. Um, they're calling on the name of God. God is coming. God is here. Even through the chaos, God works. God works in the midst of chaos. This is what he does his best work. Right now, he created the earth in the midst of chaos. Out of darkness, he created and wasn't moved that it was dark. All he said was, let there be light, and there was light. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't comprehend it, right? So here comes the light. Here comes the help. All we need is for God to say one word, and things will begin to change. But we got to talk to him. God works in the chaos and in the darkness, and we need him to work now. We have to call on his name now, more than some of us have ever called on him. And we have to trust him. We have to trust the process. If we're going to have faith in some of it, we got to believe in it all. The word tells us to pray, so we got to pray. We have to pray fervently. The reason why I chose this passage of scripture, or it was chosen again by God through me, um, is so that we can see how to pray. Listen, sometimes our prayers don't look like the answers that God gives us, right? We pray for peace and God sends us a panaya. So then you got to press in and begin to pray. And don't be bothered by the antagonizer. Don't be bothered by the person that's poking and prodding. The one that has everything right, in this story, um, is going up against and making fun of the other one that has nothing, right? So people who have rights and people who've never had their rights infringed upon are saying, man, that was a long time ago. What are you talking about? This guy made it, and it's like one out of a million. Does that make sense? The odds are stacked against some people, you know what I mean? Uh, but we have allies right now. There's more people standing up right now for justice, um, you know, for people of color than I've ever seen in my whole life. And that's the way I believe God wants it. And he's designing it just that way. We have to continue to fight the battle uh, the way that he's deciding to fight it in this season. Right? The, Jesus, we have to have a strategy. Jesus, and, and I'm beginning to close, but Jesus is a master strategist. This is what I found out. The Bible describes Jesus as both lion and lamb. Right? We want him to bite heads off all the time and be ferocious in that way. There's a time for both. When he comes back, he's coming back as the ferocious lion, right, of the tribe of Judah. But he couldn't redeem us as a roaring lion on the cross. You get that? When he was here on earth, what he allowed to come out was the lamb, right? And, and he was the good shepherd, and he loved his people, and he was kind, right? But don't get it confused. There's time he's going to come back, and he'll be ferocious. But the redeemer was a, is a lamb. Right? So we have to understand his approach in this season because he wasn't roaring up there on that cross. He was forgiving people on the cross. 
We got to forgive our enemies. Those who persecute us. As hard as it is, if Jesus can do it and they were killing them, as far as I know, most of us aren't dead. Right? Now, there's some people that have died of mysterious circumstances here in the Antelope Valley the last couple of weeks. We got to pray for their families and lift them up. But that's not everybody's story. Right? So if you're still alive, if you're watching this podcast, know this. Right? It's not time to go bust heads and get even. Does that make sense? Jesus was forgiven his oppressors on the cross. Paniah went into prayer as she was being poked and made fun of and ridiculed. We got to pray in this season right now, today. That's my challenge for you. You have to pour your soul out to the Lord. If this season grieves you, if you're tired of COVID and people being sick, if you're tired of the numbers being fabricated or not being told enough information, which is it? I don't know, but pray. I'm tired of it. Right? If you're tired of social injustice and systemic racism and inequality, pour your soul out to the Lord. Tell them that you're tired of it. Right? Take it to him. Stop telling your Facebook friends and expecting other people to stand up for your problem. Stop trying to stand up for yourself in the battle when it's an invisible enemy. The enemy is a trickster. He's a deceitful, lying son of a gun. Amen? Right? And he's hiding behind people. Um, but but the, lo the Lord wants their hearts as well. And what if you can display love and turn someone who is evil into someone that's good? Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, T.D. Jake said, God will allow an irritant to come into your life to produce a pearl in your spirit. And I thought that was perfect for today's um, lesson. Um, God is producing a pearl right now. Right? You know how sand gets in a in, um, in an oyster and it, it just irritates it and it just rubs and rubs and rubs and it's just irritated but something beautiful um, comes out of that pressing and irritation God is producing pearls right now um, you know so God will allow us to be irritated to move in our lives to move to prayer some of you to move to get a new job uh, to move and get uh, different friends where you're equally yoked with uh, sometimes the very irritation the thing that you not that you don't desire is pushing you to the place where God wants you to be. So be irritated right now, but allow your irritation to, to bring you to a place to, on your knees where you begin to pour out your soul uh, to the Lord. Amen. Uh, so we have to hold on to hope. Have to just hold on to it. That's all we got right now. Got to hold on to it. We have to believe Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Ask yourself, do you love God? To those who are called according to his purpose, are you called by God? I believe if you're listening to the word of God, you're definitely called according to his purpose. Um, so pray, fight in the spirit right now. Let's transition from the physical to the spirit. Let's begin to pour our soul out. Let's be irritated enough. Let's hate the devil enough to where we wage war against him. What if collectively, people, people of God, if we prayed more this week than we prayed all year, Right? If we can commit to pray one hour, God gives us 24 hours in a day. Everybody has the same 24 hours. What if you can commit for the next seven days uh, to pray right? for one hour of the 24 hours? You know how much power will be thrust here on earth, in heaven as it is on earth, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin to shift. Spiritual battles aren't fought on the earthly realm. They're fought in the heavenly realms. Um, let's begin to pour out our soul to the Lord and give the Lord an opportunity to fight this battle on our behalf. Amen. How's that sound? God bless you. So that's my challenge this week. Um, commit. If you commit, put in the comments, um, I commit, right? But pray one hour out of the day. It doesn't have to be an hour straight, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, uh, 10, 10 minutes every hour for a, a few hours until you make it to a, I think it'll be six hours if you did that. For six hours straight, pray for 10 minutes, right? Or if you're watching a lot of TV, pray during the commercial breaks. Um, over the span of a day, that'll be about an hour. Does that make sense? So just pray for one hour and pray for this nation. Pray for this world. Pray for those that are still sick and suffering from COVID, right? Um, pray for those that are still sick in their mind and, and oppressing people because of the the, the, the color of their skin, and that we can be judged, as the, as the great speech said, by the content of our color, not the color of our skin. Amen. But one hour, if you can commit, say, I commit in the comments, and I'm praying for you that you can keep your commitment. Amen. Amen. And for those of you who are natural intercessors, let's pick up the slack. 
For the, so some people are going to fall off. It's going it's to sound good to them on Monday. They say I commit. But then by Tuesday, some people are back to their normal routine. Right? Uh, so let's, let's begin to pray. If you already pray for an hour, pray for two. Amen. Let's, let's just do our part this week and let's just give it to God. Let's pour out our soul to the Lord and, and see real change begin to happen. Um, and, and the body of Christ be a catalyst in that change. Right now, I'm going to shift gears and, and I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation for those who desire to be saved. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, um, it's the most important decision that you'll ever make. Some people think um, asking a wife to marry them or buying a house are the most important decisions. Those peril in comparison because those things will only be here for so long, right? As much as I love my wife, um, the words of God says, we'll be married to death do us part. Right. But at my eternity lies with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you like to uh, make sure that your salvation is assured, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Just pray these words with me um, as I pray um, the, the prayer of salvation. So, Lord God, I'm a sinner. I ask you forgive me in my sins. I believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth and that he died on the cross for my sins and that God raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. I love you. Accept my, my cry. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If that's the first time you've ever said that prayer, you are now saved. Um, if you'd like to know what that means in deeper detail, get yourself involved in a good Bible Center church. Um, you can email us at ccvpalmdale at gmail.com if you'd like someone to begin to walk with you. Um, I can personally walk with some people um, to make sure that um, you understand um, what that prayer means in more detail, what it means to be saved, and what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Um, but for today, just enjoy it and know that, listen, you're saved. Um, and your salvation is assured. Uh, we're now going to go ahead and do communion. Um, and I have my communion cup here. And we'll, we'll, go, we'll use communion. Uh, the scripture I like to use is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through, through 26. And it reads like this. Um, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Um, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. 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 I think communion is so important. It just reconnects us with the Lord. Um, it represents healing. It represents a closeness to God. He said, do this as often as you think of him, do it in remembrance of him. So uh, we're just taking this time, not from ritual, because of ritual or routine, it's because we have a heart for God. Um, and we just want to show that we remember God and in, in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice today. Amen. Um, now it's time for our offering. Again, we want to sincerely thank you uh, for keeping our ministry afloat right now. A lot of people are suffering and a lot of institutions are suffering financially. Um, the Lord has kept Christ Church of the Valley um, because of your generous donations. We'd ask that um, even in the midst of um, being um, social distancing, um, that you continue to give. Give what's on your heart. Um, again, don't worry about a percentage or anything like that unless the Lord calls you to a certain number. Um, but just talk it over with the Lord and whatever the Lord says to give. Um, we thank you and we, we accept your offering and, um, with great sincerity and we just say thank you again. Um, but different ways to give online um, should be on the screen now. Um, so through PayPal or Givelify, you can go to our website or just type that web address in. Um, and, and you'll be able to give online. Um, and then also, um, we're still going to the church and checking the mailbox. So if you decide or desire to mail a check, old school style, the church address is there on the screen, CCB Palmdale uh, in the city of Palmdale there. Um, again, we thank you again. Um, also, just a reminder, join us on this same channel, CCB Palmdale Facebook Live, uh, this Tuesday at 7 p.m., uh, my bro, um, L. Michael Lee, Elder Lamont, will be teaching. Um, it's always fire. I love being a student. I love teaching, but I love being a student, especially when this guy teaches. Uh, he brings out part of the word that uh, it challenges me. I said, like, man, I didn't even know that was in there. So I promise you we're going to have a good time this Tuesday um, in the Lord. So dive into the study with us, uh, 7 o'clock Tuesday, Facebook Live. Um, and then last announcement. Um, we started our CCB Kids Summer Session 
Um, it started June 8th a couple of weeks ago, so we're two weeks in. Tomorrow we'll represent the third week. Um, Sister London uh, Robinson, um, who's over the head of our kids department, um, taught the first couple of lessons. Uh, you know, dealing with the five tenets that we're covering, faith, family, finance, fitness, and focus. Um, and we're in faith right now. Uh, and she covered uh, prayer. And she had this hand thing last week. I'd never seen that before. Blew my mind. It was awfully amazing. Right? So go to CCV Palmdale on Facebook. Um, if you have kids, the new lessons are uploaded every Monday at around 11 a.m. But you can watch the, the, the last two weeks' lessons. Um, and they're really short, you guys. I think the first one was... Eight, nine, eight, seven, eight minutes. Last week was only about five or six minutes. Um, so she gets in and gets out, but man, she hits you with some great points. Um, this week, I'm not sure if she's teaching or if my sister, um, Charlene, um, Char uh, Charlene is going to be teaching this week. Again, her husband's Lamont. They're excellent teachers um, and they do everything in excellence. So plug your kids in all the way from kindergarten to seniors in high school. The lesson is rich for the both of them. My kids really enjoyed it um, this week. So we appreciate you fellowshipping with us today. We understand that you could have been anywhere else in the world literally fellowshipping since all churches are online right now. We thank you for stopping in and sharing this time with Christ Church of the Valley. Um, we pray a blessing a special blessing for you and your family on this Father's Day. Again, men of God, um, happy Father's Day to you. My heart goes out to all those men because I was reminded as I was praying even earlier, um, some of you have lost your fathers. Um, I pray that there be no lack and no void today and that you can remember and hold on to the good times as well as fathers that have lost children. Um, I'm praying for you. My heart is heavy and goes out for you today. Um, if you need help, um, just call someone. Don't, don't suffer in silence. Um, we're, we're all men and we're all here for you today. But happy Father's Day to my brothers. God bless you. Love you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And we'll see you Tuesday for Bible study. God bless.